right, hello everyone. Merry Solstice and happy human light. I'm Joe Fox, one of the directors of the Lehigh Valley Humanist. I have to say I'm thrilled to see everyone here today and especially thr thrilled to see how far the Lehigh Valley Humanists have come in less than three years. In uh, January 2009, we had our very first hum uh, meeting with about a half dozen people in attendance. Today we have at least four events a month and, and with a great group of people at each venue. So we certainly are growing, but we also need your help. Um, we have lots of things going on throughout the, throughout the year and we have different committees and different tasks. So if, if you're so inclined to want to get involved, please see myself or one of the directors here tonight and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about how you could get more involved in, in, in the group. Um, as you can see tonight, we have an awesome program planned. Right, so welcome to the first annual hum Human Light celebration here in the Lehigh Valley. This is the 11th year Human Light has been in existence. So I'll, I'd like to tell you a little bit about its history. Human Light is celebrated in dozens of cities around the U.S. and now globally. The official date of Human Light is December 23rd and can be celebrated on around th that date. The date was chosen so it would not conflict with all the holidays that other people may be uh, celebrating around that time. It also takes advantage of the time when most people are celebrating something, usually religious in nature. As humanists, we, we, we can now feel comfortable celebrating our own holiday this time of the year, Human Light. Human Light is, is designed to be celebrated and to express the positive secular human values of reason, hope, and compassion. I realize that many non-religious people have developed traditions around the winter solstice as a holiday rooted in nature. The solstice is clearly an important event in nature, and I personally take note of it. But it does not have any intrinsic human-oriented value or meaning. However, human light does. So a number of humanist groups and individuals have taken to holding combined celebrations of both human light and solstice events. It is very important to know that the holiday is not intended to be negative or critical towards religion or people's beliefs. It's not trying to reinterpret or, uh, or secularize Christmas, as you know, we just had a speaker about that a couple of weeks ago. It's, and it's not about criticizing what we don't believe in. Instead, it's about celebrating what we do believe in. Humanist morals, values, ethics, and principles. Celebrating human light can also sh uh, shine the light on an important fact to our friends and families and the general public that you don't need to be, have supernatural beliefs in order to live a good life. You can be good and do well without God. The name human light was chosen to indicate humanity, human, and, and not supernatural beings, and light to indicate human uh, reason as the proverbial candle in the dark. Because humanists and free thinkers tend to avoid dogma and rituals, the specific activities involved in human light celebrations are open to in invention and creativity and will differ from place to place. Celebrations I've attended and helped organize have often included social gatherings, including music, dancing, candles, entertainment, short talks, and fun activities for kids. So here you have it. There's a brief description of the central concept and ideals of, of human light. Barry Clasella is our MC. He's the humanist chaplain at Rutgers University, a position that was originated in 2009. He has performed ceremonies of various kinds, weddings, memorials, baby namings, renewal of vows since 2003. And, he's a and he was, was certified as a humanist celebrant in 2005. He has written for the Humanist Magazine about the importance of the arts and humanist perspective and authored a section on, on rituals and ceremonies in the new Encyclopedia of Unbelief. Please welcome Barry Cassell. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Shout it out. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I have to tell you that the, the last time I was in Allentown was at the airport last winter when my wife and I took a flight to visit my daughter and her family in Dallas. We were the only people on the security line. And I have to tell you, we took advantage of the valet parking. I don't know if you knew you, if you, knew you had valet parking at the airport in Allentown. 
And I, I, I would say that's quite a bit of a change from our uh, usual airport, which is Newark Liberty Airport. So I welcome all of you to this wonderful human light celebration, the first, as I understand, for the Lehigh Valley humanists as a group. Some of you may have attended other human lights. And yes, I am the humanist chaplain at Rutgers University. And in case that causes any little fluctuations of concern, I'll explain a little more about what that means as I go along. But I'm glad to have come here from across the Delaware River to bring you greetings from the state where human light originated, namely New Jersey. This is the 10th year that I've been attending such events. I missed the first year of human light in 2001 because I didn't know anything about it, never heard of it, wouldn't have conceived of it. And I also didn't know much about humanism in general at that point. But I hope you will all consider making human light a part of your tradition. It's a chance for secular people to get together among themselves and to invite their families and relatives to join them in this dark time of year, to sing, to share a meal, to tell stories, to learn some stuff, to have fun, and in general to bring light and warmth into each other's lives. Just as we know that in nature the sun will soon shine longer and longer in the sky to bring the fruitfulness of spring. At least I'm counting on it. Now, human light reminds us of the connections that we have to the cycles of nature. And equally important, human light reminds us of the connections we have to each other. It reminds us also of the connection that we have to people who have been aware of the winter solstice for thousands of years in Stonehenge, in Newgrange in Ireland, and beyond that. But Human Light itself was created 10 years ago so that humanists and atheists and other non-believers could connect to their neighbors, their family, their friends by joining in joyfully and unselfconsciously when others say, Happy holidays, because now we have a holiday of our own. Now, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I took our granddaughter, Myra, who's three years old and who's with us today, to see a storyteller at a library near us. And the program was about various December holiday traditions. We heard stories, we sang songs, and when we sang the 12 days of Christmas, Myra was the one, I think it was fixed, she was the one who was given the picture of the golden ring. And she learned to hold it up every time the list of gifts from my true love gave to me slowed down to mention the five golden rings. She would hold it up. At the end of the show, uh, when the storyteller asked for other traditions that hadn't been mentioned in her program, I raised my hand and I told her about human light and what it's about. And she seemed genuinely interested and very liberal-minded, and I think she might add it to her show next time she does it. But what struck me it was, was that it was so easy to feel the warmth and the joy generated by the familiar music and stories at the library. 
even though I'm not a believer in the traditions from which they come. So uh, what I want to say to you is, as human light spreads to more and more places, and as humanism spreads to more and more places, in the Lehigh Valley and beyond, we must remember that we need to satisfy the same human needs for belonging, for friendship, for caring, along with our delightful skepticism when it comes to superstition and the supernatural. Now at Rutgers, where I'm the humanist chaplain, my first goal has been to create a sense of welcoming community for students who already consider themselves secular, and maybe even more important to those who may be exploring their own doubts for the first time at college, and to let them know that they don't have to do that alone. And so my second goal at Rutgers is to let everyone know about us. The 40,000 students that are in New Brunswick, the 400,000 alumni that are around the country, let them know that humanists have a presence and a voice on campus. And being the chaplain has been an important part of that process. So I've made my presence known, for example, by speaking at a vigil, along with other chaplains, in the memory of Tyler Clementi, the gay student who was in the news. And I've addressed alumni during reunion weekend. And I've given the humanist viewpoint at a colloquium for honors students. The colloquium had the general topic of belonging, belonging as an immigrant, as a native, as a religious person following a certain tradition. And my perspective was, what does it mean to belong as a humanist? What do we belong to, our little group? Or something much beyond that, the whole history of, of humankind. And I've also spoken at NYU, and I led a session in Boston, Massachusetts, at the National uh, at American Humanist Association annual, annual meeting. And I talked about the benefits of potential, uh, the potential benefits of having humanist chaplains at colleges and universities around the country to serve students who are starting the time in their lives when they're questioning. And on more of a one-to-one -one basis, I answered a religious student who asked, in all seriousness, all seriousness, why would two people get married if they didn't want the blessing of God? What would be the point? And he asked me because I'm the humanist chaplain, so I might have, you know, he thought I might have a good answer to that. And I've also helped students deal with the issues of coming out as an atheist to religious parents. And those were all done in an attempt to make a human, a human connection with all people at the same time as I promote our humanist values. But that human connection was something that never should be forgotten. Now we're going to soon light candles to represent the humanist ideals, simply expressed as reason, compassion, and hope. It's by applying these ideals to our actions that we light the way to a better future for all of us. Now we had our human light party at Rutgers this past Monday, and I asked students to think about something. I want to ask you to think about something. I asked students to review the past year and to come up with 
a sign of hope that they had encountered in the past year, a sign of hope for the future. And let me tell you, it was hard for some of them to think of anything right off the bat as a sign of hope for the future. But then we did come up with, with a few. In fact, my wife, on the way home, she said, I reviewed the year in my head and I couldn't think of anything. Let's see if we ourselves here can come up with something. If you think of something, just raise your hand. What gave you hope in this past year? Something personal? Something in the news? Something you've heard about or seen? And tell us also why it's important to you. Yes, please. Good, so thank you for showing up. <laughs> Somebody else. Maybe in politics, uh, it's hard to find there. Science. Yes. Science and democracy. Okay. Springtime in the Middle East. Arab Spring, but we were talking about the sun coming up again tomorrow. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, come on, there's got to be some other signs of hope. Yes. Okay, there you go. Now we're starting to think in the, along those terms. What, what else have been signs of hope? How about from the band? <laughs> Put you on, putting you on the spot? Have you been getting more gigs? No? <laughs> so therefore you've been able to work together and come up with better songs. Great music this year. Okay, yes. Come on! <laughs> We're going to hear some of that today. Yes? Okay. Keep reviewing. Yes. That just happened, right? Or it's almost complete. Other signs of hope. Yeah. Okay. Did you find some personally? Not talking. Okay. <laughs> Good, yeah. I had a, a second granddaughter born um, beginning of September. And I was in Sweden to um, be part of that whole experience. This is my first granddaughter, three years old. My other one is three months old. <laughs> Any other signs of hope? You know, it, maybe it's good to kind of, yes. <laughs> Anybody else? You know, maybe it's good to make a list of these th things throughout the year because we tend to forget. Save them up to the next human light when you can come with two dozen each. Signs of hope. Okay, we're going to do our candle lighting now. So would Darren Smith and his two children, Madeline and Amanda, please come to the candle lighting table this flame shines with the light of reason 
May it illuminate the wonders of our world. This flame glows with a warm compassion. May it expand the caring circle of our love. This flame beams like a hope-filled beacon. May it sustain us through the darkest winter night. These three flames mark a joyful season. May they unite us in a happy human light. And may reason, compassion, and hope light the path of every human life. So our final event uh, of the evening is it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker who came directly from an appearance this afternoon in Morristown, New Jersey, at a human light there. Fred Edwards has a long history in organized humanism. For 15 years, he was executive director of the American Humanist Association and for 12 years, editor of the Humanist Magazine. He's past president of Camp Quest, which is a summer camp for free-thinking children, in case you have any or plan to have any children who are looking for camps. And he served on the board of the International Humanist and Ethical Union and the founding board of the National Center for Science Education. And over the past 35 years, he's appeared on national and local television in the United States and Canada and been interviewed around the world, lectured in North America, Europe, and India. And today, he serves the humanist community as national director of the United Coalition of Reason, which is an organization founded in 2009 that fosters cooperation among local groups in the community of reason and launches billboard ads and bus campaigns to raise the public profile of such groups. And he also serves on the faculty of the Humanist Institute and is national director of the International Darwin Day Foundation. And Fred is here to talk to us about some of the things that have been haunting him for many years. His talk is called The Ghost of Christmas Past. Fred? Oh, there he is. <laughs> All right. Now, how many of you have heard? of the Reason Rally that is scheduled for Washington, D.C. All right, for those of you who haven't heard of it, the Reason Rally is going to be a great coming out party for all of us. Humanists, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, all sorts of people on March 24th, 2012 on the National Mall and the American Humanist Association and the uh, United Coalition of Reason and all of the other leading organizations in our movement uh, have pitched in uh, thousands of dollars to make this possible. And we're and Margaret Downey, who many of you might have heard of, she is arranging bus uh, trips to get all of you to get down there to the National Mall in Washington, D.C. and participate in this great rally so we can let the people know that we're here. We've arrived. That we're here, we're godless, get used to it. All right. Now, as we've been seeing with the activities that we've been enjoying this evening, something positive is happening. Something positive lies just below the surface of the current culture war controversies surrounding the winter holiday season. Yes, church-state separation struggles still confront certain holiday displays on government land. 
Some businesses still wrestle with that great question as to whether to wish customers happy holidays or a merry Christmas. Some government entities become entangled in that gigantic legal question of whether to call their official display a holiday tree or a Christmas tree. Major political issue, don't you think? Some in the religious right declare themselves under siege, that there is a war on Christmas. Well, some atheist groups seem to oblige them by putting up challenging billboards. And Christian churches have long strived year after year to put Christ back in Christmas. But as all this goes on, a growing number of humanists like us prefer to come in from that winter storm to set aside a special time in December as human light, a time for celebration, friendship, family fun, and conviviality. Humanists have no belief in a God and give no special regard to Jesus, but they know that human beings all over the world from pre-Christian times to the present have celebrated the arrival of winter as a special moment in the year. And because of this, the winter holidays are, to humanists and to others, a truly human observance. Human light was conceived then as an expression of specifically humanist ideals and sentiments. The positive vision of a peaceful, ethical, enlightened, and happy world that we as humans can bring about without reliance on concepts of supernatural entities. So it was given its own day. This was a vision not only to be celebrated, but passed along to our children, families, and friends. Roy Speckard, executive director of the American Humanist, spoke to this in 2006, saying, there is no reason why humanist families can't enjoy the holiday season in many of the same ways that other people do. Yuletide celebrations became secularized in the United States in the early 19th century, so humanists and other non-theists have been participating in their own ways for a long, long time. Now, we're doing it together. And that's the beauty of human life. It's a way for millions of non-theistic people, whether they call themselves humanists, free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, brights, pastafarians, to recognize and observe this season in ways that are both unique and inclusive. Human light unites them all. But why the name human light? Well, this is the season in which in the northern hemisphere the lights, uh, the nights grow longer until on the solstice the nights start to grow shorter again and the days grow longer. Some ancient peoples worried that the darkness would eventually snuff out the light of day engaged in the practice of sympathetic magic to bring the light back to make the days start to grow longer. And to do this, they lit bonfires or Yule logs to coax the sun by example. Now, this idea of sympathetic magic was very popular in the ancient world. Uh, and I'm not sure quite why it was popular, but when they wanted their crops to be fruitful and grow, and they wanted them, them to, to prosper and rise, they wanted to give birth to a new uh, harvest, they would go out in the fields and have sex. That's sympathetic magic, all right, that's the way it works. Well, so they lit bonfires at this time of year to coax the sun, by example. In 1892, the great American agnostic Robert G. Ingersoll wrote, again we celebrate the victory of light over darkness, the god of day over the hosts of night, Again, Samson is victorious over Delilah, and Hercules triumphs once more over Omphali. In the embrace of Isis, Osiris rises from the dead, and the scowling Typhon is defeated once more. Again, Apollo, with unerring aim, with his arrows from the quiver of light, destroys the serpent of shadow. This is the festival of Thor, of Baldur, and of Prometheus. 
Again, the Buddha, by a miracle, escapes from the tyrant of Madura. Zoroaster foils the king. Bacchus laughs at the rage of Cadmus, and Krishna eludes the tyrant. This is the festival of the sun god, and as such, let its observance be universal. This is the great day of the first religion, the mother of all religions, the worship of the sun. Now, of course, in our modern world, this is not such a mystery anymore. We understand the cycles of the Earth's revolution around the sun and the way it tilts at different times of the year. So we're no longer worried about becoming enveloped in celestial darkness. We don't need to worship the sun. But there are other kinds of darkness to be overcome. The darkness of these very superstitious fears, for example. Ingersoll said, let us all hope for the triumph of light, the light of reason, for the victory of fact over falsehood, of science over superstition. And so our tradition has developed, a tradition that began in the imagination of Gary Brill, and then in the new millennium, Joe Fox said, let there be light, and brought human light into being. Today, this celebration is spread from coast to coast in the United States and overseas. To better appreciate and develop human light, however, I think we need to explore the more distant past. This is because not only does that past cradle the cultural memory of humanity and thus give us insights into our deepest reasons for celebrating at this time of year, it offers us a source of forgotten ideas that can be revitalized in our day to make our celebration richer. To begin, today happens to be the first day of the ancient Roman festival of Saturnalia, the Feast of Saturn, a god of harvest, a celebration that ran from December 17th to the winter solstice, recognized in those days as falling on the 23rd. It featured wild parties, gift giving, and halls decked with laurel. It also was characterized by a reversal of the social order. Masters served their slaves. As Roman Catholicism replaced ancient Roman polytheism, Christianity found it necessary to adopt its holidays. The last day of Saturnalia, by then, celebrated on December 25th, becoming the birthday of Christ. This pragmatic move, made sometime in the third century, did not, however, meet with general or universal approval. The Christians of the Middle East viewed their European brethren as idolaters and sun worshipers for attempting to render such a pagan festival Christian. And the first war on Christmas was engaged. But the adoption of non-Christian customs continued nonetheless. The Madonna and child icon was developed from the mother and child Im imagery of Sibylle and Attis, mother of God and sun god, in use at Rome. Itself rooted in the older Egyptian imagery of Isis and Osiris, the child in each case being born on December 25th. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, the evergreen tree was added from Teutonic culture. Holly and mistletoe, sacred to the Druids, was the Celtic contribution, and the Yule log and caroling were products of Anglo-Saxon England. Throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, the Saturnalia practice of wild celebration over many days was continued. This became the 12 days of Christmas, the first day being Christmas itself, the whole season ending on Twelfth Night, January 5th, the Eve of Epiphany, January 6th, which is the day the Eastern Orthodox celebrate. This Christianized orgy of mirth and mayhem came complete with a mockery of political institutions. Each Christmas season, some beggar or other individual low on the social ladder was elected Lord of Misrule. In England, still today, Twelfth Night is celebrated with masquerade balls and parties. And so we can see there's much about modern Christmas celebrations that are rooted in pre-Christian observances. The ancient Hebrews referred to the winter solstice as the rebirth of light, 
calling their celebration the Festival of Nairat, meaning Festival of Lights. Bonfires were lit for a week and a day to encourage nature by suggestion. Again, that's sympathetic magic. It was practiced by the ancient Hebrews. Later, when Judah Maccabee defeated the Greeks and captured Jerusalem, he decided to rededicate the temple shrine to Yahweh during Nairat, renaming the holiday Hanukkah, which means dedication. During Roman times, the historic role of Judah Maccabee was downplayed, Yahweh getting top billing for a supernatural intervention that allowed a small amount of holy oil to last for eight days. The holiday itself was also downplayed, being reduced to a minor celebration where it remained until our time. But as Sherwin Wine noted in his book, Judaism Beyond God, in North America, in particular, the competition of Christmas rescued Hanukkah. It was taken from its theological mothballs and elevated to a status that even the Maccabees never imagined. Suddenly, candles, dreidels, potato pancakes, and the story of a minor military victory were dressed up to compete with Christmas carols, Christmas trees, the birth of a god, and the excitement of a new year. Humanistic Jews today reach back to the origins of Hanukkah and see it as a celebration of human mastery of fire, a symbol of human ingenuity and conquest of nature, the bringing of light to darkness. But the Christmas celebration, as we Americans know it, is largely a recent development. It's not a product of a continuous evolution over time. There was actually a long break in which Christmas was hardly celebrated in many Western countries. For you see, think of the pilgrims, if you will, coming to our shores. Who were these pilgrims? They were Puritans, and they outlawed the holiday. They don't tell you that story in school, but the pilgrims did not celebrate Christmas. Thus later, in the early American colonies, most Protestants, particularly in New England, wouldn't celebrate Christmas because it was viewed as Catholic. Did you ever wonder why George Washington's largely Protestant troops didn't object to crossing the Delaware on Christmas Eve night to attack the Catholic Hessians Christmas morning and catch them drunk on their keisters? It was another day to the colonists, that's all it was just another day. That's why they were able to do it. That's why there was no Christmas truce in the American Revolution. Our folks didn't celebrate it. But something began to happen in the early 1800s that generated the modern Christmas industry in Great Britain and the United States. And this ind industry was secular from the get-go designed to gradually take the Christ out of Christmas so that the observance would no longer be viewed as a sectarian holiday. And this would allow Protestants to celebrate it. It pretty much all started with Washington Irving, the man who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. But much earlier in 1809, he wrote his satirical Knickerbocker's History of New York in which a jolly St. Nicholas figures prominently. Then later in a sketchbook published in 1818, Irving wrote five sketches that were later combined into a separate volume called Old Christmas. In those writings, he praises the holiday without ever mentioning Jesus or naming Christianity, though he implies them. But he primarily speaks nostalgically of quaint country celebrations of the holiday, recreating what he imagined or wanted Christmas to have been like back in the old days, back before the English Civil Wars led by Puritans, Oliver Cromwell, in the mid-1600s. Washington Irving wanted to treat them as though they were from his own past experience. The observance had actually pretty much died out in England until he and others revived it. He also helped generate the desire in the United States to emulate those British customs. Christmas first became a legal holiday in England in 1834. Charles Dickens glorified it in a false nostalgia of his own in the Pickwick Papers, published in 1836. 
In 1843, he wrote his more famous A Christmas Carol, which he then took on the lecture circuit in Britain and the United States, doing dramatic readings before large audiences. Dickens would later credit Irving as an inspiration for the book. As for Christmas becoming a legal holiday in the United States, Alabama was the first state to declare it so. That was in 1836. Pennsylvania made it a legal holiday in 1848. Okay, so it wasn't a legal holiday at the founding of this country. Pennsylvania didn't make it a holiday until 1848. The practice had become general finally across the states by the end of the Civil War. Christmas cards first appeared in 1846. The first Christmas tree decorated with candy canes appeared a year later. In 1867, Macy's first kept its doors open until midnight for Christmas shoppers. It instituted its Thanksgiving Day Parade in 1924. Retailers began lobbying in 1939 to move Thanksgiving back a week earlier in November to increase the length of the Christmas shopping season and they succeeded when Congress moved the date in 1941. Regarding Santa Claus, the poem The Night Before Christmas first appeared in 1823, changing Santa's flying horse and wagon to a flying sleigh pulled by reindeer. Though still called Saint Nick, this character no longer dressed like a Catholic bishop, but was more in the manner of a pagan old man winner, Father Frost and Father Christmas image of Northern Europe. In other words, reminiscent of the Norse god Odin. And he was magical rather than holy. It would remain for political cartoonist Thomas Nast to create the consensus image of Santa Claus beginning in 1862 and the Coca-Cola Company to codify his red and white colors in the 1940s. Although letters to Santa began appearing in the early 19th century, many were letters from Santa warning children to be good lest they get nothing for Christmas. One forgotten tradition from the period of the British American revival of Christmas that might bear reconsideration is the Victorian Christmas ghost story. Yes, people used to sit around the fireplace and share legends of ghosts and hauntings or read suspenseful short stories and novels featuring this seasonal twist. And they're still being written. After all, late December brings us the longest nights of the year. A perfect opportunity for nocturnal entertainment of some sort or another. The practice is even mentioned in the secular holiday song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. The line goes, there'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmas long, long ago. And if you wonder how a humanist might be chilled by a ghost story, consider horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, an atheist. He knew that nothing could be more frightening to a person with a naturalistic worldview than the thought that the supernatural might really exist. It would undercut our entire sense of reality. <laughs> Scary indeed. Well, we all know that ghosts figure in Dickens' Christmas Carol, but where else? Well, another of Dickens' Christmas ghost stories is called The Story of the Goblins Who Stole a Sexton. A sexton is a gravedigger. In this, we meet another Scrooge-like character, a surly gravedigger named Gabriel Grubb, who insists on doing some grave digging Christmas Eve night just to cheer himself up. <laughs> but in the cemetery he encounters the king of the goblins who pulls him under the earth into a large cave. And there the grave digger is shown visions of ordinary people living difficult lives who nonetheless manage not to be as surly as the great digger but actually to maintain an optimistic outlook. From this Gabriel Grubb gets the message that it is a very decent and respectable sort of world after all, and is reformed. Outside of fiction, we find Christmas ghost stories in folklore. 
So I'd like to share one with you from Wisconsin, retold by S.E. Slosher, called Andy. A man was walking home late one night when he sensed he was being followed. But he looked back and no one was there. The soft thud of following footsteps echoed behind him as he hurried through the snowflakes toward home. They kept pace with him, quickening when he quickened and slowing when he slowed. It was creepy. His flesh crawled at the sound and he sped up, cursing himself for walking home alone from the midnight Christmas mass. Normally not a pious man, the middle-aged bachelor had suddenly been struck by a wish to hear the old Christmas songs sung once again by a church choir, and he walked across town to attend the service. Now he regretted his choice as he passed dark house after dark house in the snowy night, and the footsteps ever followed. He sped up until he was nearly running and finally skidded onto his street. A few more paces brought him to the bottom of his front steps, and as he dashed up them, he realized suddenly that the following footsteps had ceased abruptly. He glanced behind him at the cross street from which he just turned and saw only one pair of footprints in the snow-covered street when there should have been two. He frowned in puzzlement and then shuddered as a cold breeze struck him, driving snow against his collar and slammed against the door. Almost, it seemed, to pass through the door. But that was superstitious nonsense. His hand was shaking as he unlocked the front door and hurried inside. He expected darkness, but was delighted to see the yellow glow of firelight coming from his study doorway upstairs. His old housekeeper, whom he thought firmly asleep in her attic bedroom, must have lit the fire pending his return. He shrugged out of his coat and paused for a moment, amazed to find it still warm and dry. How could his coat be still warm and dry? He had walked for more than a mile through a snowstorm. It was almost as if he'd been walking in a bubble of calm air, though he remembered the soft snowflakes hitting his face when he first stepped out of church before the mysterious footsteps had begun. His shudder was interrupted by a shout of greeting as his old friend Andy came hurrying out of the study. His whole face lit up in a grin at the unexpected surprise. The two men shook hands heartily and re retreated back to the warmth of the firelight, talking so fast they stumbled over each other's words. Andy had left town years ago to take a government job in Washington, D.C., and they hadn't seen each other since. Nearly an hour passed before it occurred to him that his guests might be hungry. His offer of a meal was instantly accepted, but Andy was unwilling to leave the comfort of the fire to eat in the kitchen. So he jogged downstairs alone to fetch some food. He didn't wonder at his friend's reluctance to join him in the kitchen. Andy had looked very pale and had kept shivering with cold while they talked. He hoped his friend wasn't ailing. A few moments later, he was back with the warmed up meat and potatoes and a couple of glasses of beer, apologizing profusely as he handed Andy a plate. And Andy just laughed and hunkered down to eat. When they were both finished, he showed his friend to the guest room and then tumbled into his own bed and fell immediately to sleep. All his apprehension caused by the mysterious footsteps forgotten in the visit of his friend. He jumped out of bed Christmas morning and dashed immediately downstairs to the guest room to rouse his friend Andy. But Andy wasn't there and the bed had not been slept in. That was odd. He ran down to look in the study, but Andy wasn't there either. And one plate full of food was sitting on the end table beside his old friend's chair. It was completely untouched, though he'd seen Andy eating from it the night before. Skin creeping at the thought, he ran to the kitchen and asked his housekeeper if she'd seen Andy. But the housekeeper had seen no one, either the previous night or in the morning. He flopped down on the bottom step of the staircase, completely baffled. Where had Andy gone? 
It was a mystery that plagued him all Christmas Day, and he did not enjoy his holiday dinner at all, a fact that annoyed his housekeeper. He was awakened the next morning from a restless sleep by the sound of the front doorbell. He stumbled out of bed and was splashing water from the bedside pitcher onto his sleepy eyes when a knock came at his bedroom door. When he answered, his housekeeper handed him a telegram that had just arrived. As he hurried back downstairs to prepare his breakfast, he opened it curiously, not knowing who would be telegraphing him so urgently. As he read the telegram, he started to tremble. The message was short and to the point. Andy's family regretted to inform him that his old friend had passed away on Christmas Eve in his home in Washington, D.C. He sat down hard on the bed, the telegram fluttering away from his hand. It must have been Andy who had followed him home on Christmas Eve. That would explain the eerie footsteps and the dry coat in the middle of the snowstorm. He'd spent Christmas Eve with a ghost. All right. That's a sample offering to offer a change of pace for the holidays and suggest a Victorian tradition that could be revived. December ghost tales offer a way to make creative use of those long, cold nights, and it doesn't cost any money. But whatever we choose to do, we know that honoring this season in some way or other is among the longest of human traditions. As such, it is eminently humanist. We only need to ensure that our celebrations relate to our lives today and ultimately express the positive human values to which we aspire. Happy Human Life. <laughs>